Good evening. On behalf of the commissioners and staff, I would like to welcome you to the June 28th City of Roseville Public Utilities Commission meeting. This seven-member commission is responsible for studying and advising the City Council regarding all utilities owned or operated by the City, including electric, water, wastewater, and solid waste. The Public Utilities Commission advises the City Council regarding planning, rates, public information, cable television franchises, and other matters relating to such enterprises, and may also hear citizen complaints as to operational rates. The Public Utilities Commission also advises the City Council regarding the activities of such joint powers agencies as the City may be a member of or which relate to such utility enterprises. At this time, I'd like to ask everyone to put your electronic devices on silent. Lynn, could you please call the roll? And for the record, uh, Commissioner DeLacy and Commissioner Granger are excused from the meeting this evening. Okay. Commissioner Granger is out. Uh, and excused. Um, Chair Whip? Present. Commissioner Knox? Present. Commissioner DeLacy is excused. Commissioner Maish? Here. And Commissioner Bielski? Present. Thank you. And uh, if you, um, uh, Commissioner DeMarchi, could you I, please get, um, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item no number four on our agenda is public comments. This item is for anyone who would like to address the commission on any item that's not on tonight's agenda. When addressing the commission, please state your first and last name for the record. Not seeing any public comment, I'd like to move to the next item. Uh, our next item is approval of the minutes. Uh, uh, would, uh, do we have a motion to approve the May 24th minutes? So moved. Yeah. And do I have a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Nay. It passes. Uh, our next um, agenda item is the uh, requests and presentations. Uh, first up is the Roseville Electric Utility Monthly Update uh, by uh, Dan Beans, the Electric Utility Director. And uh, so if you are ready, please go ahead. Thank you and good evening, Madam Chair. So uh, I have three items for tonight. Uh, one of them is our integrated resource planning process, which is a usually about a year-long process we do every five years and I wanted to let you know tomorrow June 29th at 5 30 p.m. at Maidu Community Center we're gonna have our first public workshop and so this integrated work, work our integrated resource plan is to uh, have community input in how we meet our requirements for energy and what what flavor uh, what color uh, how much uh, how much it costs those kind of things so it's, um, it's a very important community um, input to help you know, see what people want, what's most important to them. And so we'll have staff there giving presentations, we'll have surveys, we have a website, uh, we will have a web page set up. And um, if you have questions about it, you can actually email electricirp at roseville.ca.us. So um, Definitely come on down if you have time, and anybody from the public is obviously welcome. There will be cookies. So, <laughs> uh, also per your request, I believe we uh, we set up some power plant tours for commissioners, and right now we have tours scheduled for July 15th at 9 a.m. and August 12th at 9 a.m. But if there's other dates and times that work better for you, we can also add those. Uh, while you're there, you'll be able to take a look at the uh, the DWR emergency mobile generators, which are close to being commissioned. They're a lot bigger than they were before because the emissions controls for them is about three times the size of each of the generators. So they're very clean, or will be. Um, the last item I want to talk about is transformer supply chain issues. And I believe I mentioned this maybe last meeting. Uh, there's a shortage of grain-oriented steel in the United States. And there's labor issues due to COVID and other things um, and some other material issues. And so uh, we have not 
gotten a transformer delivered to us in uh, this year at all. Um, we have a few hundred on order. The prices of the transformers are, have increased 400, 500%. The lead time has gone from three months to up to three years with still no uh, for sure delivery date. So uh, transformers are, you know, that's all the development goes on. Every subdivision has several transformers. Um, we can't get them. So uh, we are, that is our number one issue right now is trying to get transformers. So to that end, we've been meeting with our, uh, the North State uh, Building Industry Association and they connected us up with uh, the National Association of Home Builders in Washington, D.C. And so two weeks ago, during the council meeting, I was actually out there in D.C. lobbying on Capitol Hill with their group. We talked uh, to six congressional offices, two congressmen, and um, explained to them the situation, which none of them were aware, um, and tried to explain how serious not having transformers is. I mean, it's a national security issue, obviously. It's uh, economic development. It's a housing issue. It's a uh, greenhouse gas issue. It's uh, try to electrify the, the vehicles out there, and you have no, no house to plug in your, your vehicle to. So it's a, it's a serious issue. Um, I also got asked, because I've been so vocal on this, to be part of a national um, team. So I'm one of four um, public power directors that are on a team with uh, some other um, co-op directors and um, Edison Institute. And so we, it's part, it's called the uh, Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council, and it's a industry group that coordinates with government agencies. And so we've started a pretty vigorous process. We meet weekly uh, right now um, via Teams, but um, there could be some travel involved. We're going to be meeting with manufacturers. We're going to try to figure out what exactly the holdup is, what we can do, what, what the government can do. And so we'll be actively um, trying to solve this problem. Um, we're also reaching out to other uh, cities nearby who have similar uh, situation or similar voltage, but maybe they're not growing as fast as we are, so maybe they have spare uh, equipment. So we're, we're doing everything we can. There's a national database we're participating in, and we uh, have started to engage in looking at um, outside suppliers. So we think we've, we can get some uh, transformers out of Korea. And so we're going to try that too and get some of those on the way. Um, those are probably going to be, once we get the purchase order out, it'll be about six months. So maybe by the end of the year, we'll have at least a few transformers. Um, but something's got to give. This This is, we have no more transformers to put in the, out in the field. So right now the developers are just connecting up to the transformers we've already installed out there. Because um, we normally, we, so we stay ahead of development. They they, they get their certain amount of infrastructure in, we put in the electrical, and then they just start building. Um, they still have several they can build with, but we can't put any more out. So it's, uh, it's a big deal. Yes? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, so what's the rate at which we use transformers to replace transformers? That's a great question. So <laughs> car pull, or no, it's not a pull, but a car hitting a transformer or just failure, we typically go through about 15 a year, and so we have saved three years' worth in the yard because obviously our first commitment is to our existing customers and making sure we can restore their power. Uh, now, nationally, this is an issue um, not just for pad mount transformers like we use, but also for overhead pull tops. And right now, the American Public Power Association, do the, they've done some surveys, and uh, we could probably get through one hurricane this season and recover from it okay if there's two there's probably not going to be enough transformers and this is a nationwide serious issue so like i said there's nothing we won't do to try to um that's legal that that we can do to try to solve this problem <laughs> although we have tossed out some yeah. other ideas but uh well, anyway um uh refresh us on the time that the uh public um, input meeting is it's yeah. at, and, and the, the details? Sure. So tomorrow, June 29th at 5.30 at the Maidu Community Center. Okay. And there'll be a second one in October, October 18th, same time, same place. 
Oh, no, actually, no, a different place. Same time at the Mahaney Library Community Room. I should read my notes. Um, wow. So in terms of the uh, transformer shortage, um, is there a way to do some uh, refurbishment of existing uh, units? Yes, there is that. Um, and we are, we're in contact with some manufacturers or remanufacturers that do that. Another approach we've taken is we've, uh, the American Power Association sent a letter to the Department of Energy asking them to relax, temporarily at least, their efficiency standards. Um, in 2016, they changed those standards. They made them you know, a fraction more efficient at a very high manufacturing cost and made the steel that they have to use even harder to get. So if they can relax some of those things, they might open up more steel availability. But there's also... Uh, we probably need to get some of that steel more globally if we can, although, I mean, Ukraine and Russia are, is some of the, I think, 10% of the steel we use in the United States comes from there. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just not a good situation. And the other complicating factor is the steel is also used in electric vehicle motors, and that market is just starting to go. And as it gets really ramped up, it's going to be a bigger and bigger problem. That's why I try to emphasize to the congressional staff is this is not a transitory thing. You can't just ship some baby formula in. This is a, a long, sustained, serious issue and has the potential of really shutting down our economy and a lot of other things. What was the type of steel again? That's it's uh, it goes grain oriented uh, electrical steel. I think they call it G O E S. Department of Commerce did a very comprehensive study in 2017. They published it in 2018. And, you know, people are just now noticing. So, um, okay. anyway, it's it's a complex issue, but it's one we're, we're chasing hard, so. Go ahead. Did, did we already pay for these, or is it pay on receipt? I think we pay we write a purchase order we probably don't pay till we get them okay but so. what the way it works though is the developers pay us for them um, when they get the project approved and then we order them and and deliver them so there's some that we owe the developers they've already paid for so as soon as those come in we'll quickly get them out to them um but yeah it's it's a like I said, it's, this is my number one issue. I've been taking it. Uh, everything I have, I can, I'm can. i putting on it. So, Questions over here? And this is a hurricane reference. Is that referring to the shipping coming through the Just Gulf? Just the amount of um, inventory. So say you got a big hurricane in the south, the east, it takes the, out a bunch of poles and transformers. Gotcha. They, the it'll time. take them a while to repair those, you know, replace them. And it'll probably deplete most of their stock, which means if another hurricane in three or four, and I don't even know how many we had last year, but I believe it was more than one, um, it's going to get really, really nasty. The good thing for us is we need pad mount transformers, which are not pole mounted. So it's a different product, but same, similar steel, or same steel. So. However, in my neighborhood, somebody actually ran over one. Yeah, we people lost. need to really not do that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, th those transformers now cost as much as a car, and obviously really hard to get. Um, is there a way to um, retrofit our transformers so that they're harder to hit? I'm I'm imagining concrete, you know, a reinforced steel, a concrete reinforced, uh, you know, kind of like the bo the round things in front of yeah. Target. By the time you did that, it'd probably cost even more than the transformer now. So yeah, it, it would be it'd be a tough ask of the developers to hey, can you? Uh, plus, it wouldn't be very nice. Oh, it, it might not be pretty. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully, everyone just you know don't drive a, keep off the sidewalks with your car. <laughs> I guess. Any more questions over here? Over there. Um, is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward and address the commission on this item? Not seeing any um, people to uh, uh, comment on this. I want to thank you so much, um, Dan, for your updates. Thank you. Item number two for today, uh, 6.2, is the uh, Roosevelt Electric Customer Solutions Programs Overview. Uh, we're happy to have um, uh, the Electric Customer Solutions Survi uh, Supervisor, David Bradford, uh, to uh, come talk to us and summarize the, the programs. Excellent. Thank you. 
Chair Webb, Commissioners, good evening. Uh, my name is, as you mentioned, David Bradford. I oversee the customer program services and account management for the electric utility. And I'm here tonight with a brief presentation on the offerings that we have for our community this year. <clears throat> our utility programs provide many benefits to our community. They help our customers reduce the cost of, to operate their homes and businesses. They encourage energy efficiency in practice and through the use of technology. They provide education to help our customers understand how they use energy and how to conserve. They encourage customers to invest in their homes and businesses with incentives that make upgrades more affordable. Uh, these programs help our customers reduce the impact they have on the environment. Our incentives help promote new technologies in ways that encourage the market adoption and drive down costs. And they help us prepare for the future by allowing us to better understand how, when, and where our customers use electricity. And it's worth noting that as a public utility in California, we're required um, by the state to provide incentives and education uh, to help our customers manage their energy use. So where does the funding come from? This year, our programs are made possible by two primary funding sources. As I mentioned, uh, California legislation requires that publicly owned utilities implement a surcharge to fund public benefits, uh, public benefit programs, and these funds are reinvested back into the community through our programs. In addition, we participate in a state program that provides us with funding specifically for electric vehicles. Uh, here's a little bit more on each one of those funding sources. Public benefit funds. Back in 1996, utilities in California were required to establish a public benefit or public goods funds. In Roseville, we allocate 2.85% of our annual revenues to meet this requirement. These funds must be used to invest in energy efficiency education and technology, renewable energy programs, low income rates and programs, as well as research and development. These programs help us meet our annual energy efficiency targets, which are also required by the state. These programs must meet defined cost effectiveness guidelines and provide benefits to the community. I'd also like to point out that uh, through these funds, we were able to help many of our residential customers who were struggling to pay their bills as a result of the pandemic the last couple of years. Low carbon fuel standard. The California Air Resources Board has a program called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program. It's similar to their cap and trade program. And uh, by participating in this program, we earn credits for the electricity we use uh, to provide charging for vehicles in our community. We sell these credits to entities who need them and use the proceeds to fund our electric vehicle programs. These programs must be designed to equitably benefit current and future EV owners and provide education and awareness of electric vehicle technology. So these are the primary funding sources that we have, and now I'll take you through the programs that we offer. Our programs mainly fall into three categories. We have building electrification, electric vehicles, and energy efficiency. So building electrification. Roseville Electric Utility recognizes the importance of preparing for the electrification of new and existing buildings by offering voluntary incentives. Electric equipment in homes and commercial buildings are more efficient and cleaner than natural gas powered equipment. We're beginning to see interest in converting to all electric buildings here in our community. We're preparing to meet the needs of our customers by offering voluntary incentives and education to help our customers transition while making buildings more efficient. Our programs also help new home builders who choose to develop all electric neighborhoods here in Roseville. Electric vehicle programs. Driven by state goals and market demand, we're seeing more and more electric vehicles on our road. Uh, our programs and incentives help us prepare for a future where electricity will be the primary source of fuel for transportation. Our programs help us understand what the future, uh, um, I'm sorry, will help us understand the, uh, the way our customers use electricity in the future and help us prepare for those needs now. And the best part is we're able to utilize funding from state programs to invest in infrastructure here in Roseville. Energy efficiency programs. Our energy efficiency programs help our residents and businesses upgrade to more efficient equipment and better manage their energy use. 
Our broad portfolio of rebates means we can help with almost any project, as well as provide customers with knowledge and information they need to take their energy use into their own hands. Rebate levels and incentives are assessed regularly to ensure value and cost effectiveness. Over the last couple years, uh, we've been able to leverage these programs to assist our business community uh, as they struggled from the impacts of the pandemic. We were able to offer increased incentives and assist with small, uh, our small and medium businesses here in Roseville. Uh, for more details on our rebate programs, including incentive levels, you can visit our website at roseville.ca.us slash rebates or give us a call at 79POWER. Uh, the community, I'm sorry, the uh, Customer Solutions Division of our utility is constantly looking for new and innovative ways to help our customers save energy. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Questions over here? No? <clears throat> Go ahead. I just had one. Um, insula I didn't see insulation on the list. We don't offer an insulation rebate right now. They're very difficult rebates to, to maintain and manage. Uh, so, but it is part of a, a, a broad uh, array of types of, of rebates that we continue to look at and see if they're uh, cost effective to offer. All right. Um, no? Did you have a question? No. Questions over here? Does Go the ahead. city offer any types of rebate for going partial solar? Going partial solar. We currently do not offer rebates for solar. Uh, we were required to offer rebates for solar for 10 years, uh, back between 2006 and 2016. Uh, we were required by the state, but those requirements have now fallen off, and so we no longer offer rebates. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Um, is there any uh, one in the public who'd like to come forward and address the commission on this item? Not seeing uh, interest in uh, a question from the public. I want to say thank you, uh, David, for your update. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our next um, item is the Roseville Electric Utility 2022 Summer Preparedness Plan Overview. Uh, this uh, report is being given to us by the Electric Operations Manager, Jason Grace, Power Supply and Portfolio Supervisor Bill Forsyth and Communications and Marketing Manager Aaron Fry, providing an overview of Roseville Electric Utilities 2022 Summer Preparedness Plan. So uh, when you, whenever you're ready. I think we're ready. Are you guys ready? Yeah. So thank you for having us. So tonight we're going to talk to you about some of the activities that we perform uh, to be ready for our summer peak load. As you know, Roseville is a summer peaking utility meaning that our, our highest load occurs in the summer and not in the winter. Um, so we do this, I mean our goal is to make sure the power is available for the customer. In short, we keep the lights on. And uh, that's what our teams, that's what our teams do here. So next slide please. So we, uh, we're gonna talk to you tonight about four key areas for this plan. Uh, as soon as the next slide comes up, <laughs> there we go. Um, our distribution system, and this is the physical delivery system to our customers. This is how we get the power from generation through our, our distribution system to the service to the customer. Um, we'll talk to you a little bit about emergency management. That encompasses actually a lot of things um, from our standard operating procedures, our control center locations, um, qualified staffing, to fleet the equipment that we operate and keeping everything uh, ready to go at a moment's notice. Uh, power supply to ensure we have enough generation to meet the customer demand. And communications, which is paramount to keep everything running internally. And then, of course, our customers informed uh, nothing really functions correctly out there without good communication. So that is a, a key focus for us. Oh, are we back on? Our distribution system um, includes our substations. Uh, I'm gonna show you a slide in a minute that'll, that'll kind of go over, give you an overview of what that looks like. Um, we look at system planning. We look at our capital improvement projects. What needs to be done before we reach our summer peak? Uh, what should we delay until after? We really don't wanna take any major maintenance or work on any work orders that are gonna take, you know, 
chunks of the grid offline uh, for extended periods of time unless we absolutely have to do that. So we need to plan it around our, our peak load times because we can transfer load onto other circuits that might be able to handle it during a low period, a low peaking period like winter or fall. Uh, but maybe we can't do that so much in the summertime when all the circuits are fully loaded and we're operating at a high capacity. Um, we also, our, we look at our distribution uh, inspections, which combined with our substation inspections, uh, we look at critical assets uh, coming from those areas like uh, critical facilities, hospitals, law enforcement, railroad, um, wildfire, mit wildfire mitigation areas. We do have a couple areas in the cities that are open space that we take a close look at, especially when the weather starts to turn. Um, next slide, please. So this right here, what you're looking at, this is our distribution system on the left. Uh, the light blue there, you can see those are our underground facilities. Now we have uh, over 800 miles of it. And pretty much the entire system terminates into those green boxes that you see all over the city. We have thousands and thousands of them. I think just in transformers alone, we're right over 20,000, uh, over 4,000 poles and so on. So there, there are a lot of assets tied into that distribution <coughs> system. And then of course we have substations that are tied into that. That's where the, the power is basically fed from onto those feeders. On the right, that's our overhead system. Uh, a little bit smaller, but still it's over 140 miles of wire poles, overhead transformers, and those types of things. Um, that we are maintaining. So it, it is a lot, and it is a lot of work to keep up with that. So on our next slide, uh, continuing with the distribution system, um, part of our preparedness procedures, we look at our um, operational uh, policies. How do we do things? Do we need to update anything? Part of our plan is to be able to change the plan to fit whatever is going on at the moment. Uh, we do that a lot, especially uh, per incident. When we get, like Dan mentioned, the carpole accidents or car versus equipment accidents, uh, every situation can be unique and different depending on how the circuits are tied in that particular location may dictate how we have to operate for that specific incident. Um, we look at uh, also our communications. How do we communicate with the crews? What if a primary system fails? What do we do for a backup system? Um, do we test that? Yes, we do. Um, and then that leads us into the wildfire mitigation. Now we are a low impact area. We have a pretty aggressive vegetation management system around those dark blue areas you saw on the previous slide. The, uh, where the state dictates we might be able to trim at 18 inches to four feet, we're trimming at 10 feet and we've done that for the last 20 years. Uh, we're, we're pretty proud of that. We don't start fires. We'd like to never do that. So we, we keep a pretty aggressive eye on how that stuff works. There is an area within Roseville that uh, we work with the fire department on that we're treating a little bit um, with, with a higher criticality and we call it our wildfire reduction zone. If uh, we can go in the next slide, I'll show you what that looks like. So that's an area along Miners Ravine. It goes from Sierra College down to Darling Way. And we don't have facilities in that entire area, but we do have it in about three quarters of it. Um, so in there, we recently replaced all our fusing that feeds our transformers and different things, um, some tap lines coming out of that overhead system with the pictures you see on the lower right. And what those are, are a special type of fuse. The only one at the time we got them approved by CAL FIRE um, that will prevent a, a spark from occurring should, should the device need to operate, um, say a fault or something occurs, a line hits the ground because a vehicle takes a pole out or something like that. Uh, so the idea is to prevent that fire ignition and uh, we installed that, we're monitoring that. So far we like it. Um, if it works the way as advertised, then we intend to put that in more open space areas in the city. So on the, this slide here, I just want to illustrate that Roseville is not in a high fire threat area. Um, tier two and three are elevated and extreme risk areas as defined by the state. We are in what's uh, considered a tier one which is uh, like a local response area, meaning we have enough resources available to put a fire out before it ever reaches, um, you know, up the mountains past Auburn that you can see there into some of the, into some of the areas that could turn catastrophic. Okay, continuing on. Um, 
So our emergency management, so our DOC activation procedures, our DOC is our Department Operations Center. That's our command and control uh, facility um, that we use depending on an incident. If an incident gets large enough, we open up this center and that's how we control the situation until it's over. Uh, load shedding or distribution load shedding, you know, how would we shed load if we're instructed to? Um, what's our priorities for grid restoration? And these are generally rated by criticality, you know, maybe hospitals being one of the primary ones we, we need to try to get back, uh, that type of thing. Um, our power restoration sequence, so that's generally how do we get the power back to the customer? We may have to get our sub-transmission lines energized first, then we get into our distribution circuits, and then the service to the customer. Uh, black starting procedures, now that's mostly reactive. Um, we receive instructions from, say, WAPA or SMUD, and then we're going to have to be reactive to that based on the amount of power that we might get back into the system. How do we distribute it and what do we do with it? Next up would be training. Um, <coughs> We do a, a system emergency drill, and this year we actually expanded on that, and we included a state level, a major grid loss, which included loss of generation, um, not just at the local level, but on a statewide level, to see how would we react in that situation. So we took a stand down day, and we simulated that, and then we had everybody react to injects in the simulation on what was going on in real time. And we did this for a specific period to basically test our procedures, test our staff, uh, is there places that we need to make improvements, uh, are there things that we need to change. And that, that is a regular thing that we do uh, annually before we hit our summer peak. We also decided to test a bulk electric system collapse, like a west coast collapse of power, where all the regional states lose power. How do we come out of that? And then what does that look like for us? now? We've never gone through that, and hopefully we never do, but we're trying to be prepared should such an event happen. And then that gets into system recovery. How do we recover our system? How do we restart? How do we stabilize the load? That's going to be one of the big things. Um, we probably won't get all the load at once. We'll get some load back to us from our outside sources, and then we're going to have to find ways to dis distribute that power, get it stable so that we can get everybody back up and running the, the way they need to be. So with that, I will turn it over to Bill. Thank you, Jason. Um, so I'll give you an overview of the power supply side. So the highlights of what I'm gonna talk about are on this slide, so just so you're aware, we've secured 120% um, of our expected peak load this summer. That peak is expected to be about 340 megawatts, and our Balancing Authority bank that we're in projects that we can meet, that the whole uh, balancing area can meet the demand. Potential issues and concerns that we have, uh, PG&E alerted us that they plan to do a little bit of some work over a couple days in August uh, that will take the Roseville Power Plant 2 down for a couple days. And as many of you are aware, we have <clears throat> much lower than average rainfall from the supply side, that's impacted us. About 48% of our projected hydro supply isn't gonna be there this summer. Next slide, please. So to talk a little bit about just an overview of the state. So California's got about nine different balancing authorities operating in some parts of the state. The ISO is about 80% of California's demand. Roseville's in bank. Bank is about 8% of California's demand, and in bank with Roseville is Modesto, Smud, Redding, the city of Shasta Lake, Trinity, and Wapa. Next slide, please. So Jason talked about some of the, the threats we have and some of the, the bigger events that could lead to uh, big statewide events. And last year we did have on July 9th uh, there was an incident with, some of you may be aware of the bootleg fire in Oregon. Uh, for a period of a few hours, um, that line was derated. Well, that line was derated for multiple days, but the key incident there was uh, for a couple hours, we lost 90% of the ability to bring energy into California. 
So Kaiso Bank and Turlock Irrigation District, three BAs uh, that rely on that line, went into an EEA-2 and an EEA-3 event. So for Bank, that event lasted about two hours. There was no loss of load in Bank. And over on the left side of the screen, you can of the slide, you can see what these EEAs mean. So an EEA-1, that just means the, the, the grid is low on reserves. An EEA-2 means that all mitigation steps have been taken. And when you get to an EEA-3, you're running the risk of possibly shedding load. Um, so the overall impact to Roseville was uh, in that couple hours, we had to shift up where we were getting the supply. So we lost about 45 megawatts that we were bringing down from Oregon, and we replaced that loss using Roseville Power Plant 2, our NCPA resources we exported into bank, and we got some support from WAPA. Next slide, please. So to give you a little idea of the 80% of the state, the ISO, uh, they feel that their situation has improved in 2022 versus 2021. Kaiso has added batteries and they've added import capability to, to bring energy in from out of state by about 2,500 megawatts. Kaiso's peak load has gone up about 1,000 megawatts. So the ISO looks at this as they've gained about 15 hundred megawatts in overall capability. With that said, the ISO also has said they expect more, declaring more EEA events, so more emergencies, and that's mostly given the intermittent resources that have, have grown tremendously um, on their grid, solar, wind, um, but they also expect less loss of load given that they have so much battery storage that's been added. Next slide. So a little overview of bank. So bank's plan that we put together with our bank partners every year um, it looks good. The bank supply is 5,765 megawatts this year. The bank peak forecast is about 40, over 4,700 megawatts. And so that gives bank a reserve margin of about 120%. Um, next slide, please. So. For Roseville, to give you a little more insight on Roseville, so in the past year, we've added 20 megawatts in a long-term contract. So we've added 20 megawatts of hydro capacity to our portfolio. Um, our forecast peak is 338 megawatts, and we have a supply of over 400 megawatts. So uh, just to go a little bit into what a reserve margin is and why 120% is important, Good utility practice has always been to have 115% of your expected peak load. The ISO footprint just recently upped theirs to 117.5. For Roseville, we've updated ours for May through September, the most critical months. We've upped it to 120%. So um, given the hydro, the derated hydro, we still have 120% and uh, uh, over 400 megawatts. Next slide. Oh, I guess that's it for me. Good evening. I'll be addressing our communications approach uh, related to our summer preparedness plan. And as Jason mentioned, communications is paramount, and not only during an emergency, but more importantly, leading up to a scenario. So that's something we've focused on pretty heavily the past three years, is communicating early and often and ensuring that our customers have access to resources to stay informed and also to change behavior when it comes to conservation. So in the summer of 2021, we launched our Plan Ahead Roseville campaign. And as I mentioned, this was largely focused on conserving energy during the peak hours, but also updating contact information with the utility to ensure in the case of an EEA 2 or 3 that we have the proper channels to communicate during those emergencies. So during this campaign, we encouraged them to visit our website for updates, also to update their contact information information 
and we had a significant paid advertising campaign. We plan on launching phase two of our Plan Ahead campaign to educate our customers a little bit more this summer in regard to drought and what impact that has directly on the resources available to power their homes. So that'll be a social media campaign as well as a radio remote that runs starting the week of July 11th. Um, in addition to what we saw from last summer and the heightened concerns throughout the state and the region, we've also looked at how we can enhance some of our existing resources, which I'll touch on here in just a couple of slides, particularly related to our outage communication system, which launched at the end of 2020. So first and foremost, what we look for from our customers, if you could go to the next slide, is really focusing on conservation. When it comes to a peak alert or to an EEA two or three, we need to see action immediately from our customers. So we're really encouraging residents, not just during the summer months, but throughout the year to switch their behavior. Use large appliances early in the morning, late in the evening, when they're charging their electric vehicles, shift that to overnight so they're ready in the morning for their travel. Um, these small steps can have an immediate impact on the resources that are available here in our community and how we can support uh, regional colleagues as well. And then second phase of our approach is really to make sure that we have appropriate contact information. We coordinate not only with other departments within the city, but also with the county to ensure that alerts are sent out in a timely fashion during these types of emergencies. So it's critical that our customers have the most updated cell phone and email addresses in our system as well as we always encourage people to follow us on social media. And more importantly, we have launched a text messaging alert system through our outage communication. So if customers go on to our outage page, which is listed here on the slide, they can register their cell phone number or email address so they can get real-time information in the case of an emergency, whether that be an outage or a potential peak alert scenario. And with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about our summer preparedness plan. Over here. Uh, over here. Uh, so the commissioners don't have any questions. Is there anyone from the public who'd like to come forward and address the commission on this item? Not seeing any interest to um, comment. I want to thank uh, all of you, um, Jason, Bill, and Aaron, for your report today. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we uh, are going to shift to um, reports from the environmental utilities. Um, we've got the monthly update uh, by Devin Whittington. He is the Environmental Utilities Assistant Director, and she'll, he'll be uh, summarizing the monthly status for uh, what we call EU uh, Environmental Utilities. Good evening, commissioners. So this evening we just have one update, and it's kind of a go back. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, flow control with the Western Placer Waste Management Authority and where we are now and what we did basically back in April. So in April, we committed uh, a third of our tonnage to Western Placer Waste Management Authority, and that was to give us the ability to explore other options and execute other options as needed. Uh, part of this is we're looking at constructing our own material recovery facility out in the west side of town. It's currently at the end of the city limits. Um, we were approached by Western Placer Waste Management Authority to further extend flow commitments for a three-year period. This would increase bond ratings for uh, the authority and also be able to lower interest rates and then lower rates for the region. So currently, going to council on July 6th will be amendment, an amendment to the flow control commitment to commit the full tonnage for three years. Uh, this is actually a, a, good, a good thing for both parties. This will allow us to get through some of our initial design work and some of our environmental planning for the site, and this will enhance the uh, bond rating for Western Placer Waste Management Authority. And so with that, I'll turn it back to you guys for any questions you have on flow control. Questions over here? Um, over here? So. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Please go ahead. It, that was that was really short. <laughs> you're, you're talking about the third can, aren't you? 
So, so if we move, if we construct our own facility, it would be what they call a clean material recovery facility. So that would be a third can. Currently, we use a mixed waste system. So uh, a few meetings ago, we gave a more in-depth uh, conversation about, you know, what the difference is between those two. But what we're looking at now is there's two different approaches to compliance. We view the, the clean MRF scenario with a three-container system getting us into compliance easier in a mixed waste system. And the reason for that is in the SB 1383 regulations, it has four compliance pathways. One of those is a three container system, number one. The second is a mixed waste system utilizing a green waste container, our current system we have. The third is a strictly mixed waste system, so that'd be one container. And then the fourth is a what they call a performance approach. So you'd have to prove quantitatively how you're extracting 75% of the organics from the waste stream. Um, the second approach, which we currently have, which is a two container system, we still have to utilize what they call a high diversion organics recovery facility. That's what WATMA is trying to create at this moment in time, but we'd have to quantitatively prove that we're extracting 75% of the organics from the waste stream. With a three container system, we uh, comply basically just by having the program in place and having residents put organics into the green waste. So, so um what percentage of the city will be on the three can system? So when we move towards getting the facility constructed, so currently right now, everybody for the next three years will be on a two container system, the mixed waste system. Once we have our facilities in place, we will slowly transition about three quarters of the city to a three container system. Uh, we're going to still try to utilize a mixed waste system as long as we can for multifamily and mixed use businesses. So those are like, for example, some of the businesses you see downtown here that have apartment complexes above and then built, you know, shops and things like that below or any type of apartment complex in the city. And that was... I mean, we made a deal with the county to make sure that they got a certain percentage of our of our waste stream, so that so that they'd have our fees, so that they could afford the bonding, right? Correct. In order to build this facility, and that percentage is a quarter. And you think you can meet that with mostly commercial and uh, multifamily, huh? So we are, yeah. So we're we're, we're estimating five years from now that that thirty eight thousand tons that we committed. And then the 9,000 tons of green waste will be there. There's a lot of mixed-use projects going on in the city, and those would be the most applicable for that type of operation. Yeah. Anyway, it, 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 you know, as, as I've thought about it, because I, I heard your presentation to the city council, it, it, you, you've got two paths, and a big chunk of the city is going to be on this mixed waste system, which, um, which has a certain amount of, of regulatory risk associated with it, as you've described. And uh, so it's interesting to see which one will be more efficient. We're going to have two horses in the race, sort of. So we're going to be able to evaluate both, too. So as we go through the environmental work uh, of, our, of our site, we can still evaluate, you know, the uh, – functionality of both systems and then also the compliance of both systems. What we recognize by having a three container system, and I didn't mention this earlier, is we can take advantage of lower tipping fees. So currently our tipping fees at Western Placer are $88 a ton. Those will be going up with the new bonds being issued and a new contractor coming on board here actually this Friday, the 1st of July. We can, utilize, we can take advantage of tipping fees in the region if we bring a large amount of our waste there, like in the $35 ton category. Uh, the, the issue is we'd have to transport the waste up to those facilities, and that's why it's key that we have our own facility going through environmental and ready to construct because then we can basically put three refuse collection trucks into one truck and transport that up to the facility rather than hauling each individual refuse truck up to the disposal location. Interesting. Thank you. And it, and we'll have more updates coming to PUC on this issue as it, as it matures. It's a, quite a dynamic issue. I mean, Joe could even tell you we've been working on this thing for probably six months and it's changed. I don't know. Today. Yeah, today it actually changed. So anyway. Questions over here? Uh, is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward and address the commission on this item? 
Seeing no interest from the public, I want to say thank you for your updates, Devin. Uh, our next item is the Environmental Utilities Water Efficiency Division Overview. Um, today's presentation is uh, going to be the Water Conservation Administrator, Bobby Alvarez, with an overview of the water efficiency operation. Thank you for coming. Good evening, Commissioners, and thank you for having us tonight. Um, so I do have a slide set. We can go ahead and get started with that. So tonight I'm just going to be covering the lake conditions, precipitation, water reduction for the city, um, gallon per capita daily, a little bit on legislation, a drought update, and some of the actions that we're doing. So Folsom Lake looks really good. If any of you have driven past it, you can see that um, it's pretty high. For this slide, it's 111% of historical average. It's dropped probably about 3% from the time I actually did these slides, but the condition of the lake looks really good. Next slide. Just another line graph, you know, the, the blue shaded area is historical average. We're above historical average. The green line up there is, is actually second wettest year. The first wettest year was after our last drought in 2015, which was at about 95, I'm, which was at um, 95 inches of rain, actually, for the wettest. So that's actually showing the second wettest. Next slide. The reason I show this slide is because even though Folsom Lake is doing great, uh, we are an integrated system within California, and you'll see up in the upper left-hand corner Lake Oroville and Lake Shasta that aren't doing very well at all, which helps with the flow in the rivers. Um, next slide. Here's just a closer look at, at Shasta Lake. They're at 40% capacity and 49% of historical average, and so they didn't get a lot of rain up north and and um as you can see they're they're pretty low next slide please here i just wanted to show at full capacity for Folsom lake the elevations at 466 feet um, acre feet of storage is about a million acre feet what's important to note here is the water supply intake which is at 317 feet and the pump station at our treatment plant really can't start operate out of that intake because of what they call daylighting. So the, the upper level of the lake at that elevation is starting to get warm. And so the, we need the colder water. Hence the reason during our last drought, they started having discussions about putting pumps inside the lake to draw from the cooler water. Next slide, please. This is a slide that I borrowed from our hydrogeologist, which is from the, um, the uh, Bureau of Reclamation. What we're showing here is storage and elevation. So actually we're in June right now, but elevation and storage looks good, but you'll start seeing a pretty significant decrease in elevation and storage due to the flow that we're going to help to recover some of that from the lakes up north that don't have as much capacity. So it's going to go down low pretty quick. You know, we're going to have to hope for, for some rain and snow. It's still, according to this estimate here, you know, at 30, 30, 357 feet elevation still keeps us away from the daylighting scenario. But again, you know, it could be really helpful if we start getting some good rains and some snow. Next slide, please. So regarding precipitation, we did get a lot of rain early, October through December. Unfortunately, you know, even though we had significant rain, which was really good, it, it really wasn't cold enough to create snow. When we really needed it was during the time where you can see on this slide in the bar graphs between January and March, 
we actually got three inches of rain when we should have got somewhere in the neighborhood of about 26 inches on average, which creates a lot of the snowpack. Next slide, please. Here I have two graphs. They're, ex they're almost exactly the same, except the top graph is a baseline of 2020, and the bottom graph is a baseline of 2013. If you remember back in our in, in the first drought in 2015, the governor said we wanted to use a baseline of 2013, which was really good because as you can see the total, we actually used, um, we actually produced over 34,000 acre feet of water. So that was, that was a good baseline to use because that was pretty much normal operation. Um, our current governor and our current drought, they asked, that the state used a baseline of 2020. We actually used 3,000 acre feet less of waters, which makes it harder to reach that target. So if we were still using 2013, as you can see, for last month, we would actually be at almost 24% less water for the month of May, but using a baseline of 2020 on the graph above, we're only at 7.5% less than we used um, same time in 2020. Next slide, please. This slide is gallon per capita daily. Um, the thick blue line is population growth, and the bars are a combination of basically the two bars together are GPCD, but the top bar is residential gallon per capita, the bottom bar is, is gallon per capita plus um, residential gallon per capita. So that whole bar is gallon per capita daily. But if, you can, if you'll notice, as at the very beginning in 2008, you know, the city of Roseville was using a lot of water with less population. And this just really illustrates that through our water efficiency efforts, we've been able to reduce the gallon per capita daily as population goes higher. Of course, we have things like the water efficient landscape ordinance and a lot of water efficiency practices that helps with this effort. Next slide, please. So a little bit on the state mandates. Um, you know, Senate Bill 606 and Assembly Bill 1668, they're the water use efficiency um, legislation talking about indoor water use target and outdoor water use target, water loss target, and a, a commercial, industrial, and in institutional target. This is going to be an aggregate of all those targets, and by 2027, um, there will, they will, the state will assess fines on, on the cities if we're not meeting the targets that they establish for us. We do have an indoor target already. Indoor use, you probably are aware of, it's 55 gallon per person per day. And uh, the water loss target, we are actually meeting now because we've done uh, significant work since 2016 to try to reduce our loss. Um, the governor issued a statewide call of 15% voluntary in July. The city of Roseville, the next month, went to a 20% mandatory stage two in August. Um, then the governor proclaimed a drought state of emergency in October of 21, adopted the emergency in January, and then new water conservation emergency is the, to submit the supply and demand assessment, which we've been able to do, um, implement conservation actions, which we are we're doing our best to maintain. And why I have the next one in bold, which is really kind of the talk of the town now, is the non-functional turf um, as part of that regulation, which is basically turning off irrigation for areas that have turf that is non-functional, not being, not being used like a park. Next slide, please. A little bit on the drought update. So our current hydrological conditions pretty much state that we can meet reasonable water demands. 
based on that slide I showed you earlier. We do have two ASR wells that are um, in, in progress right now, but they will um, be complete by the end of 22, and I believe there's two more that are gonna be up and coming, and I believe their um, installation date is sometime in 2024, but I'll have to confirm that date. We have extremely dry weather conditions, as you can see, and based on the precipitation that I showed you earlier. Um, primary use in city of Roseville and most cities is, you know, about, for the city of Roseville, about 62% of water use during the warm weather conditions is all outdoor, all landscape water use. Um, I had that bullet on there about customers responding to weather conditions can mask the water savings. Mother Nature really drives what most customers do. You know, they walk outside, they feel it's warm outside, they think their irrigation system needs to be turned on because their plants need more water. The Regional Water Authority has actually hosted four focus groups. They held them in Spanish and in English. And what was interesting in all four groups, the groups talked about having severe drought fatigue because, you know, literally in the last seven of the 10 past years, we've been in some form of drought. Um, continuous drought, seems like a continuous drought since last one and the constant drought messaging dims their sense of urgency. It's just, it's just becoming a normal thing now. Uh, and then we need to be very selective about, and strategic, about how we message drought. Next slide, please. So sorry for the slide being so cluttered, but there's a lot of actions taking place. So we've launched an extensive conservation campaign. We got the the mailers, social media, e-blasts. We've um, done some messaging regionally and internal. Um, stress, our, stress your lawn, save your trees. We announced a three day per week watering, um, which is part of our drought stage two municipal code. So in the summer you can water up to three days. We have a joint PCWA Roseville drought ad buy on the freeway. Um, my group, we even have a booth at the local farmer's market at the fountains where, you know, it's getting a lot of attention actually and people are asking a lot of really good questions. We've increased our water waste patrols for the first quarter of 2022 by 34% for residential violations and 75% for commercial violations. We've thus far in the first quarter conducted 343 water waste house calls our typical annual water waste house calls is about 900 to 1,000, so we're well ahead of that. We've increased our cash for grass program um, from customer involvement by 171%. We've actually now will be announcing larger incentives for our rebate program. Our cash for grass program is going from a dollar per square foot up to 1,000. Dollars to a dollar fifty per square foot, up to two thousand dollars total. Um, we created prog program targeting narrow strips of turf and in parkways. Um, so we've increased that dollar amount for anything less than ten feet wide. We've begun the outreach for our CII customers, notifying them of the emergency order about. Re specifically related to the non-functional turf. And our phones have been ringing off the hook for commercial. We've just been getting a, a, a lot of reaction from a lot of our customers, commercial customers. We purchased a light board for messaging the drought and we move it every two weeks throughout the city. As many of you know, we have an inspiration garden, which is um, really drought tolerant plants. And if you haven't seen it, it's at the Utility Exploration Center, and we do a lot of uh, do-it-yourself classes to, to educate the public. Oh, good, I'm done. Any questions? Questions over here? I, I, I just had a couple. Um, I, I noticed that Folsom's gonna be dropping pretty fast. Um, and, you know, I was in the Water Forum. I don't know if you guys are in any way involved in that, but 
they like to hold water for the salmon. Do, do you have any idea how that's playing out? You know, are they, are we going to have a, are we going to be sacrificing the fall run salmon this year? You know? So I'm probably not the right person to answer that question. Yes, we are a part of the water forum. Uh, the water utility assistant director, Sean Bingley, is a part of the water forum. I have presented there once in the past. Part of that flow is environmental. So that that is part of the flow that's going to be coming out of Folsom Lake. But I'm sorry, I can't answer you. No, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's right. Yeah. Anything else? Over here, yes, go ahead. So <clears throat> during the 2015 drought, and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, the city slapped on a 10% surcharge if you used in excess of a certain amount of water. And So the surcharge is added as part of our municipal code, but we did not, we did not charge any surcharge during that time. Is it's, there, it's just in the code. In the code, but we did not. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I was thinking, you know, it, that's one way to get people to save water, obviously, by, yeah, if you know you're gonna, it's going to yeah. cost you 10% more. Yeah. Um, Can I, yeah, go ahead, please. <clears throat> so you, um, I, I noticed one of the regulations was you had to do kind of a hurry up assessment of your water supply for the year and submit it. Yep. Uh, you, you didn't say what the results were, but I assume that we've got an adequate water supply to meet all of our needs. I didn't hear the last part. I, I, I assume that we have an adequate water supply to meet all of our needs yes. in the city? Yeah. Yes, we do. And and it was a hurry up because it was due like July 1, right. so there was a lot of quick movement out there, yeah. but the, the assessment did show that we have adequate supply. More questions? Okay. Um, is there anyone in the from the public who'd like to come forward at this time to ask questions of the commission and our staff? Um, not seeing any interest in public comment. I want to thank you for your update too, Bobby. Um, uh, our next agenda item is um, board member, commissioner, and uh, staff reports. Are there any other staff reports? Are there any uh, commissioner reports? Any other questions or comments? Go ahead. Um, I, I want to report um, um, a couple of us got to take a, a tour of the city's water treatment plant on June 15th. And um, it was quite impressive. Uh, the city's got a nice facility. It's very efficient. Um, got a lot of, a lot of uh, redundancy and capacity built into it. Anyway. Reliability was the word I was really searching for. Um, you know, I, I think the city residents are in excellent hands as far as being able to have a reliable water supply. And, and then I had one other, and this is for my fellow commissioners. I, I, I wrote an article, I couldn't stand it anyway, um, regarding water that I sent into the newspaper. I don't know that they'll publish it or they won't publish it, but I did not claim to be a, a PUC commissioner and I didn't represent that I was representing anyone's views but my own. And I sent it off to uh, Rich Plecker ahead of time to make sure that I wasn't getting myself into trouble. So I just wanted you guys to know in case you read it in the paper. Okay. Um, are there any other uh, comments or questions? <coughs> Um, does anyone have any items that they'd like to uh, suggest for our future meetings? The, the only thing that, that was curious to me from the earlier presentation, I, I did, you know, Empower Placer several years ago. So, you know, it was a bundle. So we got, I re-insulated my house. I got new HVAC. I did the cash for grass. I did system pavers. I've got all, you know, drought tolerance. Well, some is drought tolerant. But... I don't know if the, if the city, if the, you know, I know it's all, you know, you got to find a pot of money somewhere to, to do that kind of thing. But to me, the insulation, because the insulation is wonderful. I mean, my house is, I don't want to, you know, use the trite phrase, cool, cool as a cucumber, but it's very, very cool. It's significantly very, very more comfortable year-round, yes. Yeah, year-round. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Okay. So, um, it sounds like there's a, a request for a... Um, uh, to include in one of your reports some information about 
uh, insulation and how that program has run in the past and what our options might be in the future. Does anyone else have a request for we um, future items? Oh. Sean Matcham, Assistant Director for Roseville Electric. I just want to answer a question with regard to uh, weather or uh, with the installation in some of our customer programs. Uh, what home weatherization and a home audit is one of the programs that we've typically offered through our public benefits programs. You heard from David earlier on that. We did pause that program during COVID because we wanted to we didn't want folks going into other folks' homes during during the, 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 the pandemic. So that was a program that we had uh, open for many years, but did pause due to COVID reasons. And that's something we can certainly take back and, and revisit the cost effectiveness and also the, the desire to open a program like that now that we uh, come out of, the, we're starting to come out of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. Uh, are there any other um, items? Um, may I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion. Second. Yeah, second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? We are adjourned. <clears throat> We're going. <laughs>